No. Are we waiting like another minute? Yes. Good morning. I'm going to give it like 45 seconds. It's 9.30 now. Is that okay? Yes. All right. Falls down to your. Uh, I'll put it back up. <laughs> He said, I can't believe you, you titled this class this name. No one was going to come. Make only ten copies. Good luck. There's a there's an evaluation. Those are for Avalon. Oh, perfect. Yeah, if you could do that, that would be wonderful. So Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Are you looking for Rabbi Yaakov Cohen? I'm not Rabbi Yaakov Cohen. <laughs> Perfect. You're in the right place. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, hey, that was really good. good First morning. time. Good morning. Hi, my name is Sasha Bodner. I'm the Director of Social Action with the Jewish Federation of Greater Houston. I really want to say thanks for being here. Welcome to our Yom Limud celebration of learning. Um, I'm honored to introduce our presenter today, Rabbi Yaakov Cohen. Rabbi Yaakov Cohen was born and raised in California. He attended Cal State University of Northridge, CSUN, for those that know, where he studied philosophy and psychology. He went on to study at a number of leading yeshiva in Jerusalem, where he received his rabbinic ordination. Rabbi Cohen has been involved in outreach in Texas for the past 16 years and is now the director of education of Torch of Houston. He learned Kabbalah, Kabbalah <coughs> under one of the greatest Kabbalists of Jerusalem, his father-in-law, Rabbi Shabtai Tai. Taisha. Taisha, thank you. A blessed memory. Rabbi Cohen has taught seminars and lectures of Kabbalah, mysticism, and Hasidic thought in both America and in Israel. Welcome. Uh, I just gave out session feedback forms. You're welcome to use those at the end. Please complete them. Uh, or, you, so you give those back to me, or you can rate on the app, on the, on the Hula app. Okay? For those of you utilizing our app, you can complete and submit the session feedback directly on the app if you prefer. Open up the session in the agenda, click rate with the stars by it, and the session feedback form would open. Answer the questions and click submit, it's that simple. Um, please make sure that everybody has their cell phones off or on vibrate so that we don't uh, disturb the class. If you have to take a call, please leave the room out of respect for the presenter and to the other participants. And finally, Rabbi Yaakov passed out the, uh, the sheets here. If there are not enough, in the spirit of... We can uh, email it to you if you want. Uh, you just give him, uh, and I'll email it to you. Sasha, okay. So, and we can also put this on the app, but in the spirit of sharing, I encourage you to, to share with a neighbor. So maybe if you're sitting next to somebody, share, share one sheet. Here's another one. Could I have a couple further now? So that's the only one we have left, so maybe two can share. Yes, yeah, someone wants to make copies. Right? Yeah. 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 That would be great. Are we good? Okay. Everybody, everybody good? So let's say, Rabbi Yaakov, come on, thank you very much, sir. All right. Now... 
It was it was a very big challenge to call this uh, this class uh, Kabbalah of the Siddur. Mm -hmm. yeah. Siddur, if everybody is familiar with, is the prayer book, the standard prayer book. Now, anybody, um, I assume either you have never been to synagogue, <laughs> or you have. Okay, uh, how many have been to synagogue? Go to synagogue, maybe somewhat regularly. Okay. And I know when I was growing up, I grew up reform, and of course, on, it was only the high holidays, the once a year, or maybe twice a year, Yom Kippur, uh, brought there as a child with my parents, made to sit in this huge hall, because they had to rent out a huge hall, and of course, I was clueless in terms of what was going on, okay? Um, so it didn't mean much to me. All my friends would like to make spit wads at each other, and you know, try to, until we drove our parents crazy, and they just kicked us out. <coughs> But of course, if you might be somewhat familiar with some of the things that do go on in the synagogue, whether you attend regularly or infrequently, right, there is a special order that I think it's very common for all denominations that go to a synagogue. There's a certain thing. Like, I remember very clear clearly the Shema. Everybody knows the Shema, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And there might be some other things before or after, and then there's, of course, there's the rabbi's speech, which is like, please help me. Okay, um, but in any case, there's a certain order of the prayer service. Now, who wrote this prayer service? Does anybody know? Men. Yes. Yeah. Oh, look. oh, we had to get someone in here like that. Okay, actually, it was, it was written by the, the, the men of the Great Assembly. The Anche Knesset Hagadola, the men of the Great Assembly, which were in 52, 520 BCE. It was just um, not too far after the destruction of the first temple. We were exiled in Babylon. And then after 70 years, we were able to come back and then start building a second temple. So it was just before or into the area, era of the second temple <coughs> where there was a group of 120 elders who were called the men of the great assembly who got together, and these were not just a bunch of guys who were hanging on the street corners, you understand? These were prophets, okay? Ezra, led by Ezra, okay? In the book of Ezra, as we have in the writings, also led by, right, Daniel, Mordechai, right? We had Azariah, right? And many of the prophets, very, very high people, were part of men of the great assembly. And, of course, what happened was, before that time, there wasn't a standard prayer book. Okay, there wasn't. It didn't exist. You had the Shema. Okay. But everybody basically knew how to relate to God. It wasn't a thing that needed to be innovated. But of course, they understood that in the future generations and what was going to happen, there was a little bit of a niche, a little bit of a, a, a detraction from how to relate to God. And they saw in the generations of the very future, in the hundreds and thousands of years of the future, that people might have a problem how to relate to God or what to say. Believe me, when I was raised reformed, I also knew there was a God. I came to believe in a God, right? But it was like, I don't know what to say, okay? So when I finally got to the yeshiva when I was 19 years old, and they go, there's a prayer book, I'm like, okay, this is awesome, okay? And it was fantastic, okay? But a lot of people have a problem with the prayer book, as we do know these days, something very serious. It's called Milumada. Milumada, which means it becomes by rote or becomes habitual, and then people don't think what it is or what it's about or what we are trying to achieve. Okay, most importantly. It's, but it was written, the first point here, it was written by people who are very high, and they put it in a very, very specific form to in order to create something. So, just to cut to the chase direct, okay, we call Tfila Avoda Shabalev. Has anybody ever heard that phrase before? No. Avoda Shabalev means service of the heart. There's sometimes where there's mitzvahs what you could do with your mind. There are mitzvahs what you can do. There are commandments, good deeds that you can do with your body. Go do chesed. And then there's what's called the service of the heart. And what do we mean by service of the heart? That's very important to understand this. Okay? So... But first, you have to understand in general what the idea of prayer is. Like I have here, prayer actually, the word in definition is lit palel. Lit palel, people will loosely translate as prayer. It does not mean that. I mean, it does, but it really means thinking. Would you believe that? 
So obviously what you have to now entertain in your mind is the concept of thinking. That means meditation. Okay? And I know that when they put this sitter together, they definitely had in mind the concept of meditation. It was a very basic practice in Judaism. It only weeded out of the mainstream practice maybe about 200, 250 years ago. But before that, it was common. It is literally our Kung Fu. You know what Kung Fu means? Kung Fu means daily practice. So like the Chinese have their Kung Fu, we have prayer. It is part of our daily practice. Okay? Avoda Shibboleth, working on the heart. Now prayer also means dreaming. Where do you get such an idea like that, Rabbi? So it comes from a verse from Jacob. When Jacob met his son, Joseph, after 22 years. They finally reunite, so happy. And Jacob's comments was, to see your face again, lohit palalti. And what does it mean, lohit palalti? I had never dreamed. I had never dreamed of seeing your face again. The idea of prayer is called vision. Visualization, maybe you've heard that phrase before. That's used in common practice these days in many meditative circles, okay? To have a vision, okay? It also means, interestingly enough, judging. The palel, which means to judge. Now that's an interesting thing. What does it mean by judging? How does judging have to do with prayer? Okay? So, just to answer real quickly, how does judging have to do with prayer? It's really when you're ju judging, when you're, when you're praying, really what you're doing is you're developing yourself into a vessel. In order to develop yourself into a vessel, you have to have clear, defined lines. That means judging. You have to say, this is not a good motivation, this is a good motivation. What are my motivations? You always have to go back into that. Okay? And you have to, and when you're talking to God, and you, by the way, you can talk to God anytime you want to, anytime. You can shut off the radio when you're driving your car and just have a conversation. And you always have to go back to what are my motivations, okay? Why do I want this? I want this or I want that. And then when you think about it, you'll say, well, that's really a silly reason. There must be a deeper reason. Or maybe there's not a deeper reason. So judging is you're going back and forth in terms of deciding, <laughs> is it the right thing that you want? And why do you want it? Okay? So those are the basic things. Now, but the interesting thing is uh, we also have a place where... <laughs> Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, when they were fighting the war against the Amalek, right? And Moshe Rabbeinu had to stand on the mountain. And every time he held his hands up high, they, the Israel were winning against the war against the Amalek. And every time he puts his hands down because he got too tired. Oh, how, how long can you hand to hold him up for? And so he had to put him down. And the, the people started losing. So he had to have his hands held up. Finally, he had to get a rock. He sat on the rock. Poor was holding his left hand up. Aaron was holding his right hand just to keep his hands up so they could win the war against the Amalek. And it says, yadav emuna kol hayom. His hands were emuna, which means faithful all day. Okay, what's it mean, faithful? The uncle is the Aramaic translation translates at as bitslosa, which <coughs> means prayer. Emuna, faith, belief, and prayer go together. It's very important. Okay? Because people think, what is faith? I'm going to give you, a, hopefully, a different definition of what emunah is and what faith is. Okay? So, the idea, really, of general terms of prayer that we all have to really come to terms with. Okay? Is when we pray, we want to ask God something, or we're in synagogue, and we're saying, okay, bring the redemption, or whatever it is. And the idea, really, is usually we're trying to... People might have the idea or the premise that we're trying to convince God to do something. We're trying to change God. God is doing things this way. He's running the world this way. This person is sick. This person is down and out. Or this person, and we're trying to change God. And that's not the case, would you believe it or not? It's not the case. <coughs> the really what we're doing when we're, when we're praying is we're changing ourselves. We're working on refining our ability to receive whatever it is that we are asking for. We are making ourselves into being a vessel to receive.
see whatever it is. And it might take a minute. It might take a week. It might take a year. It might take, like Avram Avinu, till he was 100 years old. He prayed for a son for years and years and years. Because what he was asking for was such a huge degree of light, he had to be a vessel in order to be able to receive that light. The light always has to be commensurate with the vessel. Okay? So if your vessel isn't exactly right, and the light, the infinite light, would come into this vessel, and the vessel is not prepared, you're going to have what's called broken vessel. Shattered. Okay? It ain't going to come out right. It's going to come out messed up. Okay? So the idea of prayer is we're not trying to change God. We're really changing ourselves. That's why, interesting, oddly enough, just on the side point, there's a huge rabbi by the name of the Vilna Gon, the genius of Vilna, who said, the custom is when you walk into a synagogue and you pray, give it your heart, you should never leave the same door that you came in. Isn't that strange? Not so. You know why? Because you're a different person. If you did it right, you are a different vessel. You are a different person. Unbelievable. Okay? So the idea of prayer is, of course, it's how much what you put into it. Of course, that's going to affect you, a vodashabalev, the work of the heart. Okay? But I call it and direct, and this is the most important thing, if you could get out of this, okay, today, is they call it in the modern days, you know, and the Anthony Robbins, and I heard it first from him many, many years ago when I was actually in Lakewood Yeshiva listening on an earphone. I had his cassettes. Somebody made me his cassettes in 24 days or something. It was great. Okay, I was, I was like, that was my musa. Okay, so in any case, no one knew what I was listening to because I'm in yeshiva, you know, you should be studying Talmud, right? So in any case, he comes up with the word state management. State management. You've heard that word before, anybody? State man, manage your state, not state like Kentucky. Okay. <laughs> manage your state of being. Okay? It's a, the most important thing, and it is a basic in Judaism, that our mind should dictate what our heart feels. Avodah Shabalev is state management. It's getting yourself to feel a certain way. Okay? Because a lot of times we encounter things throughout our days that don't get us to feel, that get us to feel different than maybe what we want. Okay? So many things go on in our daily experience. So we have instituted... Three times that we pray throughout the day, right? There's the morning, the afternoon, and then there's the evening, three times. They were instituted originally by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham would do the, the morning, Isaac would do the, the afternoon, and Yaakov instituted the prayer of the evening. That was the basic trend. But the men of the great assembly had to come and refine it and put it and lock it into chakras, mincha, and marif. Because why? We have to always tune in to what? The source. Okay? The most important thing of all is to know what is your source. And really, bottom line, I'm going to tell you right now, there's only one source. And that's God. Okay? So, and, the, and, and all of our work, all of the work, and all of the prayer book, and that what the intention is, is to get us to connect to that infinite source. Now, imagine yourself right now. Just imagine yourself right now. You're waking up in the morning, and you wake up in the morning, and like you might be smelling the coffee. You might not be, okay? But you're smelling the coffee, and, the, and your first thought that comes is, I am connected to the infinite source. Now, just kind of try to get a feeling of what that feels like. What does that feel like? If you were to absolutely know that with absolute clarity, absolute conviction. I'm totally connected to the infinite source. Do you believe it? Do you not believe it? You might believe it. You might believe it 10%, maybe 9% not. You might be doubtful. The idea here is to get us to a vibration of 100%. Okay? And this is how it works. What I have here simply is what we call tuning forks. Okay? Tuning forks. Anybody familiar with these? Yeah. They used to use a tune a piano, but never to tune a fish. So if I strike this, it makes a certain sound. 
Okay? Now, if I take something of the same, I'm going to try to do it here, okay? This is, a, this is an A. If I take this, this is also an A. What happens is it might be hard for you to hear it. And I strike this. What happens is this also, very slightly, you can hear it, this also has the exact same vibration, okay? This is vibrating at an A. I touch it to this. The vibration carries over. Okay? If I touch it to an E, however, what just happened? It stops. An A only knows how to affect or be affected by something with a like vibration. An A doesn't know how to affect or be affected by an E. Okay? In the same way, it doesn't carry over. Okay? We all are beings, and you must admit, when we have certain feelings, does that vibrate, yes or no? Yes, it does. And to the, so this is what a book that I'm, pre, I'm making now, God willing, is going to come out this year, called Creating Angels, is that we're taught that every single thought that we think, also every word, or every action that we do, creates an angel. Can you imagine that? I don't know if you were familiar with this before. It creates an angel, a spiritual force. That spiritual force, whether it was a good thought or a bad thought, let's just focus on thoughts for now, whether it was a good thought or a bad thought, only knows how to bring to fruition whatever it is the nature of that thought was. It doesn't know anything. Okay? It only knows whether it's good, and you, whatever it is, ice cream. Okay? But obviously, what happens is, you, have an, you create an angel, let's go for ice cream. Okay? That's just on a simple level. But then, of course, there's much more deeper, and there's much more deeper convictions that we have. Okay? That would arouse us sometimes, and then we would think certain ways. The idea here is that our mind is always thinking, but the idea here is to harness the power of the mind in order to bring to fruition whatever it is the nature of that thought is. But we have to believe it. You have to believe it with conviction. It has to vibrate. The thing is, when you vibrate on a certain tone, you're going to attract experiences which are in a like vibration with that energy. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So the idea here is state management is supposed to get you on a certain vibratory tone. To see, think certain thoughts, and that's why the, what the prayer book is geared to, to think certain thoughts to get you on a vibrational level that is going to attract experiences and which are in harmony with that energy. Does that make sense? So, of course, the rabbis are going to institute something. And then, by the way, they say, if you're ever stranded on a deserted island, and you can only take two books, don't ask me the scenario, but you can only take two books, holy books, not Gone with the Wind or Harry Potter. Okay? Um, two holy books you could grab, right? Which would those be? So one rabbi said, one, the code of Jewish law, because you have to know what to do. And two, the sitter, the prayer book. Because why? Most of all of our deepest thoughts of Judaism are within that prayer book. As we go through it, and the stages and everything it goes through, it hits all the basic tenets in Judaism within that. So when the, so when the, uh, the Anje Knesset Gadola built the Siddur, let's just work with Shachris. Now the Shachris, the way they go, it, it corresponds to the four dimensions of the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah speaks about four worlds. There's our world, and above our world, there are three other spiritual dimensions. Okay? So our world is called the world of Asiya, or we call it making. <coughs> Look at that. This is too much. Is this called a smart board? Did you hit? No, it's not so smart. 2G. <laughs> okay, fine. Can I erase it? No. How does it erase? Because Let's see if this works. No! Yeah, there we go. You have to push your awesome. button. It's called the world of Asiya, or I'll just write smaller, because I think I went off the margin. Okay? The world of making. Above that is called the world of formation, or the world of Yitzira. Above that is the world of creation, the dimension of creation. And above that is the world which you call emanation or nearness. OK? 
okay? So they understood in terms of the cosmos, how the cosmos were erected, how God made the creations, because he had to make filtration levels, you understand? You know, we can't stare at the sun directly. just got to make sure I'm on good in time. I, we can't stare at the sun directly. It would blind us. Too much light. God's got to filter it down, right? You've got to filter it down in order to be able to access the light or make use of it. Too, it's too bright. It's also blinding. So God had to filter himself through these dimensions in order for us to be able to go ahead and climb up and then climb down. Get an insight and then come back down. The angels do the same thing. The angels are ratsova show. They run and they return. They go, they go, wow, and then they got to come back down. Okay? Because we've got to remain creations, otherwise we'll zap back into infinity. Okay? So they designed the sitter specifically geared towards coinciding with the spiritual realm. So the first here, let's see, make sure I got it. My arm good. Okay. One thing is very important. I have to mention this. The Arizal, the Kabbalist, the 16th century Kabbalist, known as Rabbi Yitzchak Luria, the Ari, he said, and I saw it last night, you know, because usually I always say it in different words. He said, it is forbidden to pray with sadness. Forbidden, he uses that word. You cannot pray with a sad heart. That means you have to have total joy. Okay? Because that's not going to jive with the cosmos. Sadness don't jive with the cosmos. Okay? We know that. Yaakov Avinu was separated from his son for 22 years. He was so sad and so brokenhearted. The divine presence did not dwell on him. Not until after here Joseph was, a, was alive did the divine presence be restored. Otherwise, it, you're closed. So obviously what's happening here now, I'm telling you right now, is... Simcha is essential, okay? You have to always keep yourself in a state of joy, no matter what. That requires training, okay? We go read Garden of Amuna, you got to have Amuna. Amuna is prayer. you got to know how to pray. When things go, don't go your way, right? You make an appointment, you go up, you go out of your way, you're going to meet this person, and then they don't show up, okay? And... You know, you try to call the person, and where is the person? A lot of things going through your mind, right? One of them could be anger, right? <laughs> Most likely that somebody stood you up in an important meeting, and you only and your time is limited. And what are you going to do? So if you have a muna, you understand everything comes from God, and everything's meant to be, and there's a purpose for everything. So that's step one. That's why you need prayer, because you got to go, God, why is this happening to me, right? Where's the benefit from this? And thank God that the prayer books does help us to get in sync with that level of joy. Okay? Also, one thing that the Arizal brings, which is very important, because we do know that the Sitter is the same book. Why do I need to go and read in front of God a Hallmark card that says the exact same thing every day? That's okay. I can understand that. But if you understand from the concept of it's a meditation... And you, if you understand the concept, it's working on, it's your yoga, it's your kung fu, it's your state management program to get you to a higher level of state. So the same words are used like a mantra, a meditation, in order for you to, to get it deeper and to resonate with it on a higher level. So the idea here is he springs down that the reason why we're in exile for so long is because when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, all his soul fell apart sparks went flying all over the world. And when all of the sparks of his soul went flying all over the world to be dispersed, then it became incumbent upon mankind to gather those sparks. So, that's why we are in exile. One reason is we're here in Houston, Texas to gather holy sparks. So, when the sparks are gathered, we get to go home. That'll be the redemption of the world and Humanity will be connected to the divine as that is what is meant to be. That is why God created the world. So he brings down the Arizal that no two days are, are alike. One day is different from the second because today you have your quota of spark that you have to elevate. Now, prayer is the ultimate spark elevator. Okay? It's a way that it elevates more than anything else that we do. 
in throughout our daily activities, we are also elevating sparks then, but no two days are alike, and no two people are alike. Everybody, is, God is very big. Our biggest problem is that we limit God. God forbid. Unlimited, unlimitedness, the unlimited cosmic creator, has every single one of us has to have a specific amount of sparks for each day and time that need to be elevated. So every day is different. So that's why when you approach the sitter, even though it seems like it's the same thing, no, no, no. Today is a different set of sparks that need to be elevated. And I'm the only one who can do it, by the way. Everybody has their specific mission. Everybody has their specific soul frequency that they must resonate, they must vibrate to. Okay? That is what the Ari Zal brings down. Okay? Also, the Ari Zal brings down this very important thing. And I don't even know if we're going to finish today because this is just so big. But I'm going to, I'm going to try to. That you have to accept upon yourself before you pray. This is so amazing. This should be taught to every single kid in school in the very early stages. Is you have to accept upon yourself the mitzvah of loving your neighbor as yourself. You have to love every Jew. You have to love all of humanity. Right? But let's just start with the family first. Okay? We got enough problems with just the family. Okay? So you have to say, I now accept upon myself, before you go to pray, to love every Jew like myself. And your heart has to pump with it. Can you get your heart on a pumping state? That you, when you think, <laughs> we were challenged. It was the most challenging, I know. You know, the Baal Shem Tov says, you know, you know we, don't, we don't get into fasting anymore and any of those uh, self-afflictions. We're beyond that. It doesn't help. It's not going to help us. The Baal Shem Tov should just, just focus on three things. Three loves. Three. Love of God, love of Torah, and love of the Jewish people. Okay? Everybody to love Torah. That's so great. You can always open up a book to have an inspiring text, right? The love of God. Okay. You can get there, maybe, you know, somewhat, you know? But love of Jewish people, I, I don't know about you, but I've met a lot of people who are very challenged. <laughs> but imagine, imagine like all of the holy masters in our past, that they have a deep, deep, deep resonating love of every single Jew. And you really have to try to get that. How's that for a morning focus? Okay? So... You have to get that love and it has to be like a real pumping love. Imagine you can get that. You could, you're imagining it right now as I speak, as a matter of fact, right? You're imagining that love of everything because you know something? That's the only way that that's, helps all the prayers to be accepted. If you've got a grievance against somebody, you got a problem with somebody, right? Well, you should have solved, figured that out the night before. Because the night before, there's the most dynamic prayer before you go to sleep, which is you forgave everybody who did anything to you, whether it's this lifetime or another lifetime. Whether it's money, physically, they insulted you, you have to totally let it go. Okay? And so the next morning, you're ready to do that. Okay? It's a challenge, but like I said, if you don't start now, okay. The word baruch, that's a classic in, in, in our, in our uh, liturgy, as we all have it. And I just said, I, I, you, you can't get this enough, folks. When we say baruch atah Hashem, I say Hashem because I'm not allowed to say Hashem's name. Baruch atah Hashem, right? Baruch. What does the word Baruch mean? And this is the most deepest thing of all. And it's supposed to get us to a certain state. When we say Baruch atah Hashem, there's two definitions that we have handed down that the word Baruch means. And that blessed doesn't cut it. It's the best definition you can come up with. But for me, where I come from in California, I don't relate. Okay? <laughs> I don't go to, oh, have a blessed day. Never was in my upbringing, okay? When we were on the surf, beaches surfing, oh, have a blessed surf, right? Wasn't part of our thing. <laughs> blessed means two things. Blessed comes from the word baruch, which means comes from the word bricha, which comes from the word source. Source. So think about it. When you say, baruch atah Hashem, blessed are you God, we're saying really, God, you are the source. Think about it. God, you are the source. You really have to get to that. The most important thing ever, really, is to know that your brain, your smarts, your creativity, your talents, 
God gave them all to you. He's the ultimate source. Whatever got you your success is God. He's the source of everything. The food on your table, the car you drive, every single aspect of your life came from one source, and that is God. Whether you, and if you think it's otherwise, you got to get back on track. Okay? Because if you think, and this is the way it works, this is the way the universe works. The universe always works measure for measure. You get what you believe. You get what you believe. If you believe that your source comes from whatever, right, then God leaves you to that measure for measure. Oh, you believe in this? Go for it. Best of luck to you. Because it's going to be limited. If you believe in unlimited, if you believe in unlimitedness, I am connected to the unlimited source. I want you to say that right now. I, so everybody say, I, I am connected to the unlimited source. Now, how does that make you feel? That's a votish of a lathe. That's the work of the heart. You have to feel, I am totally connected to the unlimited source. Okay? And you have to let that resonate with you. And then your experience will be in harmony with that resonance. Okay? Those are the angels that we are creating. Okay? So, the word Baruch means source, and that's why we have to say a hundred blessings a day, because why? We forget. We do. We, they didn't institute a hundred blessings a day until King David came around, but it was really built into our system, because you've got to recognize your source a hundred times a day. You, when you go to the bathroom, you've got to recognize through the source of that, that everything came out okay. You can't take things for granted. God is my source. Thank you for that working. And when you start to thank God, you're developing, you're in the relationship. God says, oh, you're thanking me about that? I'll give you more things to thank about. As opposed to if you say, hey, how was your day, Fred? Uh, right? That was good. Right? So, uh, so God says, oh, you think that was lousy? Let me show you a more lousy. Okay? That is really how Rabbi Nachman says, when everybody greets you, an acquaintance greets you, Barashem. You got to say it with a bit of vibration. Okay, what time do I have to... Moderator. So we should we should wrap at ten fifteen. That's in five minutes, four minutes. Uh, that's in eight minutes. Eight minutes. Thank that you. That gives everybody enough time to do evaluation. Okay, great. Okay, so now we're going to go up here. Okay, that the formation of this. Whoa, what happened? Shrink it. Okay, good. Whew, that was good. I knew that. All right. So we have here the the, the way that the sitter is formulated. We have here this making starts off with a very basic. Prayers. If you look at it, just look on the sheet here. First we say, All these are deep meditations that are supposed to get us to a certain wavelength, a certain vibration, to create a certain reality. And just to think about it, I offer thanks to you, living and eternal God, for you have mercifully restored my soul. Mercifully is not the correct word. Really, the hemla with great love. God returns your soul to you with great love. And then the last final word, which is probably the most powerful word you can ever know, is Rabbah. I built you with a certain experiences. How dare you degrade what I have invested into you? Imagine yourself saying like that. Now, to go on faster, the word Baruch, of course, means you are the source. Okay? Meaning, and if you go around here, you are the source. I'm just going to go through here. Who, gives, who opens the eyes of the blind. You are the source. God who clothes the naked. You are the source who releases the bound. That means you have the ability to move. You are the source who straightens the bend. You can get it from bed. You, God, are the source who placed the land on the water, meaning I could stand. You, are God, are the source who steadies the steps of man, and you are the source who fulfilled all my needs for me. Now, if you're saying that, and you're coming with an aspect of recognition, right, so then you're realizing God is directing my life so perfectly. God, you are my source. You are the source. You prepare my steps. You prepare my day. As a matter of fact, when we do Natila Shadaim in the morning, it's an unbelievable idea concept that goes like that. Every morning we wash our hands when we get up and we have to raise our hands because we really have to realize all the work of our hands totally in the hands of God. Give it, God is my source. God is the source. Okay? So then we're on the next page. Now that's here. So they're here, basically, is on very physical things, getting up in the morning, all my needs, meaning your shoes. It has to do with your shoes, actually. So it has to do with very physical needs. We go up to another uh, level. The next level is the world of the angels. The world of the angels is called Yitzira. 
And that basically consists of a lot of psalms, okay? I made a mistake here. No, yeah, here it is. A lot of psalms, but there's one psalm which is the most important, which is the psalm of Ashrei. Actually, it's, it's Psalm 150. And in Ashrei, Ashrei Yoshe Beisecha, we have one line in it that has to be actually repeated three times. So if you repeat this line three times, so then you, um, you're guaranteed a portion in the next world. Wow, it's a one dynamic thought. The thought is an energy of this one line is so powerful. That's what it does. And, the, and you're actually supposed to do this. That's why I put the paper down. Actually, when you're in that part in the synagogue. And listen, by the way, this is most important. So when you're in the synagogue, if you get anything that I, today, and whatever's going on and you're completely bored, right? And, you, you know, there's no more messages on your cell phone, okay? Or whatever it is. You could use the sitter as a meditation, as a way for you to get yourself into a state. And in order for you to connect to the infinite. Okay? So we open our hand and we say this line, And we put ourselves in a state where we absolutely realize that God is the absolute source of everything. Not only that, but the entire planet. He has given enough sustenance for the entire planet. It's man that messes up. Okay? If, but, but basically... In potential, God is a super caterer. He provides food for everybody and everything. So we say, you open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living being. That awareness, that thought, is so powerful that it gives us a ticket to the next world. Okay? Because we realize God is infinite in His abundance. Okay? Most people think there's scarcity. That is an incorrect thought. That angel, the angel of scarcity, that mindset, creates a experience of scarcity. But if we actually hold on to our unlimited creator, the idea, the concept that we are connected to God and he's completely unlimited, you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living being. Now, you can just focus that with me right now and just be in such awe that God is so infinite that he sustains and supplies the sub everybody, everything in creation Man and animal, okay? So that's that one thought right there, and you have to hang out with that feeling, okay? And then we move up to the next. So this is like the praises of God. You have to get yourself in a praise mode. And then starts creation. Creation is where we say the Shema, okay? Now the Shema is the oneness of God, and that's where everybody has to cover their eye, their hands, take their right hand and cover their eyes, because we have to understand when we say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, the most powerful prayer that we have, okay, is we have to say, it's not God is one and not two, it's God is all there is. When you do that, you have to reach to the most, before that the prayer is, blessed are you God who chooses his people Israel with love. There's a love tone there. You have to feel that love of God. And then you say the oneness of God, which means God is all there is. And you have to repeat that within your mind all the time. You say, Shema Yisrael Hashem Rabbeinu Hashem Echad. God is one. And at the Echad, you have to picture yourself completely dissolving into the oneness of all there is. Because that's all there is, is all there is. And completely accepting with complete faith that God is running every single thing in this universe. And then, after that, we say the words, it's probably in your sheet, and you will love Hashem your God with all your heart, right? With all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your money. That means you are in such, in a state, a high state, the vibration is very high at this point. This is the potential that is so high that God, I so trust you. I'm so in love with you, whatever you want. Okay? Completely letting go of everything, that is the ultimate freedom. As a matter of fact, the Lubavitcher Rebbe says, and when you say that line, you have to imagine that God took you out of Egypt that very moment, and the joy has no bounds. Can you imagine? Say to yourself right now, my joy has no bounds. And you imagine yourself in such a joyous state just like that. I got two minutes or one? Okay, two minutes. Do you want to take any questions? I will, and just let me finish this. So now the last one, which is too much to go into. We stand up. Because here we reach the Shema, and here we're in emanation. So we're really, the sages are taking us up a mountain, up a crescendo, up into the highest realms, 
or filing, we're in the highest of places, right? And we stand there before God. We put our legs together like the angels, and we say the blessing. And the first blessing is the most important blessing. They say, actually, if you don't have intention on that first blessing, you have to go over and repeat it, okay? And that's Magain Abraham, shield of Abraham, okay? We say, blessed be you, Hashem, shield of Abraham. It's too much of a powerful thought for me to display that with you. But I will tell you, it is the most powerful because Abraham it lives within all of us. And he is a person who has a very um, specific mission that he's ready to go against the world for his specific mission. That's how Abraham did. Abraham is the Ivri. Ivri means other sider. It doesn't mean Ivri. He's a he Hebrew means other sider, meaning he drew a line against the world and says, I'm with the one God. I don't care what you do to me. Everybody has a very unique mission. Very specific. Very, very specific for each and every one of you. Magain Abraham, that blessing, is supposed to help us to be on the vibrational level where we actually got it. We understand our unique purpose in creation and how we have to express our unique soul frequency in the world by realizing that Abraham is within us. Again, Abraham is that gene, the Abraham gene, that is within us, that we are part of Abraham and his creed, okay? The rest of it, actually, the rest of the prayer book is actually coming down, okay? And it's ordered in a very specific way, as if you reach the insight, and then you have to go to certain levels in order to come back down and bring the high insight back into your daily experience. That is the Kabbalah of the sitter. Okay, now I'll be open for questions for a couple of minutes. Anybody? Could you, could you, uh, Ivri means the other side, you said? What? I'm sorry, could you redefine uh, Ivri? This? Uh, Ivri, Hebrew, Hebrew. Oh, Ivri, Hebrew. Yeah. Ivri, Avram and Ivri. So most people loosely translate that as he crossed over from the Jordan. Okay. Uh, Ivri over, lavor, means cross over. To cross. So you like transcend. But it's not the... just a physical crossing. Yeah. Oh, he's from the other side of the river, right? right? Yeah, he's from New Jersey, right? It's not that, yeah. okay? It's he crossed a line. In other words, he drew a line. The whole world was into idolatry, and he went, mm mm, there's one universal source for everybody, everything. And therefore, and he was willing to do that. We have to have that in our own unique mission to be ready to express our uniqueness and be willing to draw that line for it. And it's there, it's within us. And when we're up at that prayer, we totally access it in the feeling tone. And it vibrates within us, and it creates that reality. What I think we have time for one last question. question. Uh, and just one answer. So, if God is the eternal source, and we are to, and we are to believe that all, everything we have is to come from God, what, how much, what does that say about the amount of free will we have, or how much control we have over our faith? Excellent. So the free will is to let it go. <laughs> are you going to hang on, or are you going to let it go? Okay. So that's the free will, which mm. it takes a lot of strength. Mm -hmm. That's a great note to end up. Everybody, thank you. Join me in peace, and thank you very much. So we have, uh, just last thing before you leave, please make sure that your chairs uh, leave, leave it like you found it. And please uh, feel free to give me your evaluations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, hello. Um, one question. In that context, how do you explain a blessing or a curse? Curse is just a blessing the long way. That's what a curse is. A curse is a blessing also, but it's the long way. In other words, you have to go through the red violin until finally you reach the destination. So there's a blessing is the short way, to, and then there's the long way. There's the, there's so eventually every, everything leads to the same thing for those who have a purpose. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Now, if, if anybody had to... Uh, to